By the way, purely as an aside, I couldn't help thinking after last night's show and the news about FINA banning transgender athletes from elite female swimming, what a crying shame that Scott Morrison didn't actually follow his initial instinct, instincts on this topic. How different it all might have been had ScoMo back to the hilt the two brave Liberal women fighting so passionately for women's and girls' rights in this area. But instead, the former Prime Minister turned to focus group-driven custard and let them both swing in the breeze. You see, back in February, Senator Claire Chandler, who we had on the show last night, first introduced her bill to do exactly what FINA did yesterday to global applause, namely restrict transgender participation in women's sports. ScoMo initially supported her bill, but then he gradually crawled away from it, claiming it was only a private member's bill and refused to put the authority of the government behind it. I think we can guess why, and the name Sharma, Wilson, Keen, Zimmerman and others no doubt loom large in the backroom shenanigans that would have gone on. But Morrison's personal instinct was correct. As it was when he backed and picked the outstanding Catherine Deves to take on Zali Stegel in Warringah. It was the perfect wedge. There's Stegel, a former elite athlete herself, calling Deves transphobic and demonising her for standing up for young women and girls in sports. Will Zali Stegel now say that Fina's decision is transphobic? And if she won't, then will she apologise to Catherine Deves? In an electorate on Sydney's northern beaches where swimming is a rite of passage, Deves was spot on and her arguments have now been accepted at the most elite sporting levels in the world. As I wrote in my Spectator editorials in the run-up to the election, here was the perfect issue with which the Liberals could have, tamper-like, at the last moment galvanised a disgruntled and bored electorate and grabbed the undecided vote in the final weeks of the campaign. A genuine cultural issue that people care deeply about. That's what galvanised voters. A genuine issue about real, everyday women, not a fake tiara-studded teal issue. The opportunity was there and the moment was there and they missed it. Instead, the Prime Minister retreated in the face of disgraceful sneering and smearing from those on his own side, let alone the opposition. And next thing, Catherine Deves was silenced and forbidden by the party machine from speaking up. Cancelled by her own side. What a disgrace. How different it all could have been. Imagine the scenario. A brave Prime Minister determined to stare down the intolerant, tyrannical left in order to preserve the rights of women and girls in the face of a militant leftist woke onslaught would, in my opinion, have led to a very different electoral outcome. But have the Liberals learnt the lesson? I'm not so sure they have. Peter Dutton, who I believe is capable of winning office in three years' time, if he is determined to, still refuses to cut the umbilical cord to the disastrous policy of net zero. Instead, coming up with meaningless mumbo-jumbo about how we all oh, we need to transition to renewables, but we need coal as well. Pick a side, Pete, and stick to it. If you believe in climate alarmism, fine. Convince people they can live without cheap, reliable energy. But if you don't buy into the climate scare campaign, then stop mouthing the mantras of net zero and the climate doom-mongers. One of the brightest minds in the international energy debate is Bjorn Lomborg. Lom Lomborg believes that climate change is real and that it is happening, but he believes, what we once all believed, that the only way to tackle a problem is by forensic pragmatism know what actually needs to be done, know what you can afford to do, and be ruthless in analysing the results. This has led Lomborg, over the last decade or so, to the conclusion that it is well within our means to adapt to the worst excesses of climate change in a practical and tangible way, rather than this fantasy of changing the elements through inferior means of energy production, such as windmills and solar panels. 
Writing in the New York Post a couple of days ago, Lomborg says, and I quote, for three decades, climate campaigners have fought to make fossil fuels so expensive that people would be forced to abandon them. Their dream is becoming reality. Energy prices are spiralling out of control and will soon get even worse. Yet we are no closer to solving climate change, says Lomborg. He goes on. Since the 2015 Paris Agreement was inked, the world's 1,200 biggest energy corporations have slashed capital investment in oil and gas by more than two-thirds. Huge price rises are the inevitable result of forcing more energy out of an increasingly starved system. Lomborg cites disturbing statistics. Germany is on track to spend more than a half trillion dollars on climate policies by 2025, yet has only managed to reduce fossil fuel dependency from 84% in 2000 to 77% today. And as Peter Credlin just pointed out, Austria is now desperately panicking, trying to get more coal. Lomborg's conclusion is simple. Forget about making fossil fuels more expensive to price them out of the market. That's a mugs game. Instead, Commit a relatively small amount to innovative green technologies, including next gen generation nuclear and so on, and wait for the breakthroughs. As he points out, humanity has relied on innovation to fix other big challenges. We didn't solve air pollution by forcing everyone to stop driving, but by inventing the catalytic converter that drastically lowers pollution. He goes on, we didn't slash hunger by telling everyone to eat less but through the green revolution that enabled farmers to produce much more food, much of it from the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There you have it. The evidence, in my opinion, is clear. Rushing to meet meaningless timetables and desperate deadlines set by globalist bureaucrats, PowerPoint prezzo politicians and hysterical teenagers by destroying our cheap and reliable energy sources has been a disaster. But that is precisely what Labor is determined to carry on doing and what the Liberals are still pussyfooting around with. Peter Dutton, you need to abandon net zero and you need to do it now. You're in opposition. Oppose. Either agree with Labor and the Greens that it is imperative that we transition to renewables or argue that it is not. Either agree with Labour and the Greens that fossil futures are destroying the planet and causing the Pacific Islands to sink under the waves. Or argue that it is alarmist nonsense. Either demonise our fossil fuel industries like Labour and the Greens do. Or fight tooth and nail day and night to explain to all Australians how critical fossil fuels are to our future. Either go along with Matt Keynes and Chris Bowen's fantasies about battery storage and pumped hydro, or call it out for the fiction it is. Either demand that all our energy sources, including nuclear, be free to compete without fear or favour in an open market with no government subsidies and no endless red and green tape restrictions. Or just go along with the left's march towards Euro-style, soaring energy prices, woke myths and household misery for our poorest and most vulnerable. Either accept that Australians must sacrifice their prosperity by destroying our energy markets or, Peter, slam your fist on the table and say we will not cut a single further carbon emission until China and India match pro rata every single thing we have already done. Otherwise, Pete, get used to Albo swanning around the lodge for years to come while Mrs Kafoop's dishes pile up higher and higher in her sink.